Pick up with uh, Ashraf Lady then, uh, Chief Global Strategist at City Index. Ashraf, good morning to good you. Good morning, sir. Is the, um, the current euro dollar price, about 123, reflecting the real risks that we now see emerging in this latest round of the eurozone crisis? Um, considering that it was around 129, 130 uh, a month ago, uh, I think the fact that it is coming down to where it is right now, it is starting to reflect these risks. Um, but then again, you know, people may say, well, why aren't we at this much talked about 115? Or why aren't we at the level where we were two years ago, which was as low as 117, when things right now appear to be much worse than they were back then in 2010? And I think that uh, trying to, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people talking about the negative aspects. I think looking at the positives is that two years ago, one year ago, it was unthinkable for Spain or for the Greeks to get a one-year extension to to meet their targets. Or the, this idea of direct uh, recapitalization where the money goes into the banks and to relieve uh, uh, the burden from the state books is also was unthinkable. So the fact that we are, uh, w w that one party is admitting that they have a problem, the other party is willing to do something about it to help, is a good thing, and uh, and that's why we are not at 115 and we are not at 110. Well, Brussels has certainly delivered some concessions and less austerity and, and more leeway for the likes of Spain and potentially Greece down the track then. But we haven't exactly been given a growth plan, have we, which is what the markets were promised initially? No, we were not, and um, and that's where I think when people talk about growth, you know, it's like when the French president was running for office. I was watching the French TV around May, and and they said, "What do you mean by growth? What do you mean by the growth element?" And they said, "Well, we have to do something about reforming the job market." If you look at the newspaper today, you know, the the United Nations is warning about a four and a half million loss of jobs in the eurozone if they only focus on austerity. And then you have on the other side of the paper, the French are talking about doing. Um, more welfare. So, uh, so that is, in a way, more of an emphasis around uh, around the growth element, and giving them leeway. You know, rather than being so obsessed with the with the denominator part, debt to GDP ratio, now there are people looking at the denominator part, and and so there is a sort of more of a uh, uh, more of a leeway for that. Ashraf, coming back to what you said that basically the um, FX market is picking up on the positives as well and this is why we are not anywhere between uh, um, 117, 119 to the US dollar. But um, why is the bond market not picking up on it? Because what we're seeing is new lows on the yields, yields turning negative. Right. So we have one asset class doing it, perhaps recognizing the positive and the other one really just pushing for more and quicker when it comes to resolutions. Right. Uh, again, I could answer the same, you know, in the same question. Why are the Spanish uh, bond yields at barely below 7%? Why aren't they at 7.5%? Percent, and I think this is really a realization of the fact why the why the yields are not even even um, even higher is because there's a realization that uh, you know there there could be another L LTRO this time with less than one percent interest rate with mm. z zero point five percent that could be another potential dosage of a stimulus by the Fed like the one we saw back in December with the FX swaps. And there is also talk by, you know, I believe I, I lost count now, third QE f from the UK. Uh, so, th yeah, <laughs> so that might be one of the reasons why the bond yields are not really, really coming, mm. uh, uh, coming down. And the other story is that if you look at, uh, at uh, uh, if we're able to mention these words, at the TED spread or at the LIBOR, uh, the liquidity measures and the measures of danger in the market are relatively contained. Is it be, is because maybe somebody has asked someone to keep them low? No, maybe that talk was back in 2008. But the measures of fears, you know, these metrics of fear that we are seeing are not as, uh, as uh, pronounced higher as they were in 2008 or even in summer 2010 because there is the realization of it that the central bank may are going to have to step in. Okay, Ashraf, back to the conversation in just a moment. Yeah. Market watchers are hoping the latest FOMC minutes could provide clues about more quantitative easing. Last month, the Fed kept rates on hold and extended Operation Twist until the end of the year. But some believe the central bank may leave the door open for more action after last week's disappointing U.S. jobs data. Ashraf, are they going to be disappointed? Surely, while Operation 
Operation Twist is still working its way through. That kind of binds Bernanke's hands for doing anything more here, doesn't it? Absolutely. And the reason they did the Operation Twist until the end of the year is to basically buy time uh, you know, for, uh, for the Fed to show that the banks, we are doing something. And it's our form of a sterilized intervention. Uh, if the markets fall five, seven percent, let's say, and while this operation a twist uh, is 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 underway, then they will have to say, well, this is really a reflection of some some of the nervousness out there, and then they may have to do something which may have been hinted at right before the Greek elections, when we had those rumors that the central banks were going to have a coordinated injection of FX FX swap. So they may have to do that. Um, if 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 the Federal Reserve uh, find itself being dragged into having to uh, bring QE3 while Operation Twist is there, that means that will dilute the effectiveness, the meanings, the seriousness of, of these policies. What would happen uh, a year from now when, when the BRICS are down, you know, they're, they're, they're losing more of the growth and the U.S. jobs are basically losing more. What would the Fed have to do? Yeah, Ashraf, I totally get that point. On the other hand, we already had QE1, QE2, 2.3 trillion US dollars being right. pumped in the, into the economy, not really having an effect. In the meantime, the Fed's been twisting. Again, what we're seeing now also on a corporate level is really not filtering through. So does it really matter what time you place, what sort of instrument to add liquidity? Uh, right now, um, it does not matter because there is no urgency. I mean, wh what? how do we decide what does not matter? We're looking at the S&P 500. It doesn't dare go down below 1290 or 1300. But if it does, and if it does on the realization that the central banks are going to pull the plug, uh, then, the, then the central banks will, will have to be a force. But right now, we're not seeing these, uh, these risk metrics uh, popping as we okay. have seen last year. Okay, back with Ashraf very shortly. Otto, I mean, when people say that the German economy is slowing and slowing, and I think probably in the next uh, three to six months, you're going to see the ZEW survey, the IFO uh, uh, employment, industrial production. If these continue to go from bad to worse, that would only be a good for bonds, we would assume, and for bond yields. Uh, one, one of the fundamentals that would uh, probably lift uh, the bond yields higher which would be a nice re-entry opportunity, would be one of these once in, a, in every six months, uh, a near failed auction or uh, a lack of subscribed uh, option in, in, uh, in the German boons. How likely is that? And what would be the fundamental, the catalyst, the reasons to see bonds higher, uh, bond yields higher to re-enter? And into this market space. Well, a failed auction. I mean, that seems Not to failed, be near. Yeah, I mean, yeah, near yeah. that, uh, I, like we had a few months ago. Yeah, I think we've had that a few months ago, and, and I think it's more a matter of well, pricing, yeah. like, and, and not with a major shift. I think uh, away from where secondary prices are. So, uh, I mean, an auction. I would be surprised if that really sort of pushed yields sort of, you know, longer term uh, much higher. To me, it's more likely that sort of an overall sort of maybe a slight shift in, in risk perception in the market could probably be the, the more important thing. And, and I mean, in, in that context, as you mentioned, I mean, you know, the, the, the events around Italy and Spain and, and investor perception of that could probably have as much or potentially more What's to do with those. Briefly, uh, what do you want to own? today? What would you buy? What would you sell? Well, I think actually there's recently, despite a lot of bad press, been some indications that the market um, is turning a bit more sort of uh, positive and a bit more uh, uh, more um, keen on, on, on risk. So I do think it, it makes sense to add some risk. Um, in terms of a sort of um, sovereign context, to me it makes sense to look at some of the uh, assets in sort of uh, the so-called peripheral European area. We've been involved recently quite a bit in, in Spanish regions, some of which offer very attractive yields. Uh, some covered bonds in, in these markets are very attractive as okay. well. Otto, thanks for coming in. Otto Dictel then with us from Knight Capital Group. Ashraf, thank you for being here. Ashraf Leidy from City Index.